lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm on my own again today. Since I can only be comfortable for a little bit of time sitting on the floor here, and it seems like we've got a lot to cover, I am just kind of going to jump right into it. Um, So the big news for the week was the Biden-Putin summit in Geneva. Um, It's a mixed blessing, I guess. They're talking. That's good. Um, And uh, we'll start with the the good news. Um, They're... Both countries have agreed to return their ambassadors to the other country. Again, talking, that's good. Um, They also uh, will begin a bilateral strategic security dialogue. Um, This is related to the nuclear thing. So at least there's there's some... I mean, it's kind of sad that you have to be happy about this because they haven't made any real agreements. They've agreed to talk about having an agreement later. But um, Putin and Biden did not did release a joint statement saying um, that we reaffirmed the principle that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. I'm glad that at least the, the national leadership understands that, if not the military guys who I think kind of see it as just another tool. Um, so there is at least... Um, They've agreed to talk about this going forward, and since this is probably the single most important issue between these two countries, because it's the one that, if not resolved, uh, could end us all, um, we have to we have to see that as good news. Hopefully, these uh, these dialogues in the future will result in new treaties to limit, or better yet, eliminate the risk of nuclear war. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I, I'm at least they're talking about this. Um, of course, we've lit a bunch of treaties laps over the years. Um, we did restart New Start or extend New Start for another five years. Five years. Um, so that's good. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more in place between these two countries to to limit the the nuclear arms. Um, that's about <laughs> that's about it for the good news. Uh, the um, the rest of it, there were I don't know. There's some intransigence on both sides, um, and uh, of course, when, you know, one of the sticking points was Ukraine. It will continue to be Ukraine. Um, the U.S. supports the Ukrainian says they support Ukrainian sovereignty and independence from Russia. Um, for some reason. That includes the ethnic Russians in the Donbass uh, that are defending themselves from the Ukrainian central government that the U.S. supports. Um, And, of course, it also includes the Crimean Peninsula, which chose to accede to Russia after the Russian military secured the port in uh, Sevastopol. um, The port in Sevastopol. uh, In a bloodless quote-unquote coup... um, now, the, the truth of this is that um, the Russian military was there. Uh, the Ukrainian central government didn't have forces there. Um, the people uh, voted to become a part of Russia, and the Crimea was only a part of Ukraine because of some kind of drunken deal from Khrushchev you know, decades before. Um, it had historically been a part of Russia, and the people that live there are mostly ethnic Russians. So they would prefer to be a part of Russia. Besides, um, sp- and speaking of, I guess, the the people in the Donbass are mostly ethnic Russians too and um, had wanted to accede to Russia as well. And Putin said no, but he had, you know, would help them defend against their, their own government um, as long as their own government was going around with death squads, etc., so that's the that's the to sum up on Ukraine, um, and of course Russia is still sore about the U.S. sponsored uh, 2014 coup in Ukraine um, that you know made all these little defensive moves of theirs to take the Crimea and to help support the people of the Donbass against their own government. Um, you know, with, all of this was made necessary by the U.S. sponsored coup in 2014. And if you have any questions about that, you can still go to YouTube and listen to um, 
Victoria Newland uh, talking to uh, Piet um, and telling him essentially what the U.S. plan was for Ukraine two weeks before the coup happened and the the stated plan went into effect. So there's not really a question about whether the U.S. supported this coup or not. Um, there, there is no question. Uh, and um, so, you know, I guess Russia has some reasonable complaints on that. They did, however, agree, th- coming back to the, the current, um, Putin and Biden did agree that uh, the Minsk agreements um, – would be the basis for any future negotiations on Ukraine. Now, the Minsk agreements, uh, there are two of them. Um, they were supposed to to uh, result in a ceasefire in uh, Ukraine in the Donbass region. Uh, it didn't work. Um, but I suppose the the agreements are are still the basis for the for any future hope of a ceasefire that actually takes. Um, didn't work the first time or the second time though. So we'll see how this goes in the future. Another sticking point was the human rights question. Cause of course the U S harps on the imprisonment of uh, Navalny, who's, um, an opposition leader in Russia. Um, <laughs> and a, I think in kind of a flippant way, um, Putin responded, uh, about the imprisonment of Navalny and his crackdown on opposition groups, as the U.S. says, um, that he doesn't want something like January 6th to happen in his country. I uh, I think that that's an interesting tack for him to take on the question. Um, and, of course, Biden says it's ridiculous to compare the imprisonment of a political activist, Navalny, um, and uh, the treatment of, quote, criminals that break into the Capitol and kill a police officer. Now, there's so much wrong with that statement, I just don't even know where to begin. Um, first off, the uh, the people that broke into the Capitol, um, they actually were there for a political protest. So, you know, um, regardless of, of what happened after the fact, whether they uh, um, trespassed or, or not, uh, and I, I think that there's a question about trespassing on what's supposed to be public property, but either way, um, there's not really that much of a significant difference. There might be a difference in degree, and I don't even know if that's, you know, I don't even know if that's fair to um, talk about the opposition leadership in, or opposition parties in um, Russia and saying that they're, you know, that the the people who gathered uh, to protest at the Capitol and then ended up entering the Capitol um, on January 6th are significantly different in terms of whether they're political activists or just criminals. Uh, It's obviously a matter of perspective. I I think that probably Putin would think that um, if the people that broke into the Capitol in the U.S. are criminals, then the political activism in his country... um, is also being done by criminals. And then, of course, the other part of that, you know, Biden said once again, this was just a couple of days ago, that um, that these criminals who broke into the Capitol killed a police officer. I can't believe that this lie is still out there. Um, there has been no connection between the death of the police officer and uh, the, the protests, um, by all accounts, really, at this point. Um, it was, uh, some kind of, uh, oh, I don't remember, aneurysm, stroke, heart, something or other. Anyway, um, it didn't, he, he didn't die till the next day. He wasn't attacked by, um, by protesters. It, the two, the death and the protests, the death of this police officer, Slipnik, I think, um, and the protests are unrelated. But I guess if you keep putting this lie out there, then um, you get to justify your treatment. Um, and speaking of that treatment, of course, Navalny has been imprisoned for um, knowingly breaking the law in Russia, at least according to Putin. He knew um, he knew that what he had done was uh, illegal. 
um, and he chose to return to Russia in order to be uh, imprisoned um, for the political statement of it. But anyway, uh, Navalny has been imprisoned for two years, or his sentence is two years. I mean, they're looking at up to 25 years of imprisonment for the people that that went um, that entered the capital. So, um, you know, again, the comparison is not really on the U.S. side. Oh, well. Uh, at any rate, um, and, and kind of related to that, uh, Putin was asked in the, by the way, so they usually they do a, a joint press conference after these things. Um, they didn't this time. Uh, Putin and Biden had their own press conferences after the, their meeting. And, you know, Biden said in advance it's because um, he wanted to, you know, be clear about what was said and not, um, I guess, I don't know. He implied that uh, that anything that Putin said in there would be um, Putin taking advantage of or trying to control the narrative. And so they he didn't want to do a press conference with him or something like that. Um, at any rate, uh, Putin was asked in his press press conference how Russia planned to change since it is seen as being unpredictable uh, by the West. And um, this is about as close to losing his temper as I've seen uh, Putin do. Um, I mean, he, and he, he, it's not like he, he um, had some kind of fit or yelled or anything, but he was, he was very stern in his response. And um, he said uh, that the the U.S. had left the anti-ballistic missile treaty, um, and then um, the U.S. left the uh, intermediate nuclear forces treaty, and then the U.S. left the open skies treaty, and the U.S. sponsored the coup in Ukraine. And he says, you know, what's stable and predictable about about all of this? Um, and uh, and said that he doesn't believe that Russia is the irresponsible and predictable. Uh, one in this, um, and you kind of have to agree with them, you know, um, it is the, the U S who has been the aggressor in all this. It is the U S that has continued to expand NATO right up to Russia's doorstep. Um, the expansionary power here is not the, is not Russia. The aggressive power here is not Russia. Um, so I, I think that it was a, I think that it was a strong response, and it shows that there's still quite a bit of, um, of uh, I don't know, um, distrust, uh, I guess, between the two. And but it it is a step in the right direction that at least they're they're meeting. They spoke to each other, and Biden was actually, or Putin was actually, quite complimentary of Biden um, afterwards. Um, <laughs> I was actually surprised at him. He said that. Uh, the way that Biden had been presented as not really knowing what's going on and so forth was couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, he said that that Biden um, that nothing gets past Biden. That uh, he, you know he he um, he had to be sharp to to stay up with Biden. I personally find that hard to believe, but it was at least nice of him to say. Well, nice for Biden anyway, and. Uh, and it, it, I hope he's right, honestly. Um, I would feel a whole lot better if we had a, a, a president that I felt was, was um, mentally sharp. I almost just said competent, but because um, even that would be an improvement in some ways. But, uh, you know, it would be nice if we had a president that was mentally sharp, that, that really was on top of things and understood uh, thoroughly what was going on and was paying close attention and, um, and couldn't be, um, uh, cheated or directed or, um, manipulated in any way. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's true, but, <clears throat> but that is what Putin said afterwards. Um, referring back to the last, uh, podcast, uh, I think now is, uh, as good a time as any to talk about the, um, Fauci and public health and and so forth. Um, I hope that that you listeners went and found the sins of omission article. I was told that it was actually harder to find than I had anticipated that it 
it, that search results came up with a whole bunch of unrelated things. So um, if you need additional search uh, terms, then I would say sins of omission and um, either uh, AIDS or um, AZT uh, should do it. Because that's mostly what it, it's about. Sorry, I have to rearrange here. Um, so just a, a few of the things, like to sum up in some ways, um, it's mostly about how uh, the public health um, apparatus in the U.S. wasn't really paying attention to the doctors that were actually treating the problems. And, um, and there's a lot of parallels to be drawn between what was going on with the AIDS epidemic and what's been going on with the coronavirus pandemic, that there were um, vested interests in certain types of treatments that uh, were promoting those treatments um, and ignoring um, what seemed to be effective treatments that doctors were using in the field, um, Fauci particularly. Uh, because he's been in his position through what, seven presidents now, six, seven presidents, because um, he was appointed by uh, Reagan in 1984. Um, so he's he's actually been around all of this time. And um, I, I have very little respect for somebody who's a career bureaucrat like that to begin with. But as an example of some of this... Um, there's a certain kind of pneumonia, a certain type of pneumonia called PCP that was one of the most common actual killers of people who had contracted HIV. And um, there was a treatment that had, that had FDA approval for this particular pneumonia that was very effective. And so some of the doctors that were treating uh, HIV patients were administering this medication um, as a prophylactic because essentially what happens is that the um, people with HIV, they couldn't fight off this particular pneumonia, not effectively. So even if they, um, if they caught it and got well, they would continue to, to get it again um, until it killed them. And so um, some of the doctors started treating the, the possible symptoms, the things that were actually killing the HIV patients, and um, and doing it effectively. It was extending the, the life expectancy for, for some of these people. But um, Fauci sat on approval or refused to approve this drug as, a, as an HIV treatment um, for years. Uh, it eventually was approved, but, um, but it was a couple of years. And, you know, thousands of people died in the meantime that – that may have been um, savable if they had uh, they had gotten this particular drug, and of course uh, Fauci promoted AZT um, heavily, uh, promoted AZT, and um, in the end, it, AZT turned out to be turned out to do more harm than good. AZT was originally developed as a cancer treatment, and even the guy who created it. Um, threw it on the scrap pile because it was so toxic to the system that it did successfully kill cancer cells and every other cell. And um, so it, it, was, it was so bad for the person that even though it was killing the bad stuff, it was killing the good stuff too, and it made them sicker. And it did the same thing with the uh, HIV patients. And, uh, but it was promoted really strongly, and, and for those of you that were around then, you might remember um, that AZT was the first drug that was really promoted as an HIV treatment. It was supposed to be a real game changer. Um, but in actual fact, they, uh, they stopped their, um, uh, they stopped their testing early, um, after something like four to six months. And during that time, AZT seemed to help. But if you continued the treatment longer, um, then the, the life expectancy for the AZT, uh, patients um, was lower than those who didn't get it at all. So it would do some some good for a little while, and then it would kill you quicker. Is essentially what happened. Um, but they they cut off all of the testing um, once they'd shown a little bit of improvement, and they didn't go back to it afterwards. And of course, the testing was done by the company that developed it, 
and it was all accepted and and so forth. It's it's actually when you start reading about that stuff in this article, you start thinking about um, these vaccines. And you may remember the clip we played oh a month or so ago, um, where they said point blank that they had called back all of their um, uh, control group and given them the vaccine. Uh, so essentially, yeah, ending the testing um, after you know this many months instead of the often three to five years that vaccines are tested. And Fauci has a real um, one-track mind in terms of vaccines. Vaccines are really good for the drug companies because um, they essentially uh, bear no risk, and um, especially vaccines that have to be repeated and vaccines that are required by the U.S. government or um, school system or what have you are just windfalls for the vaccine companies. They um, they go into it with essentially no risk, and the requirements mean that that everybody has to get it or uh, a large portion of the population has to get it. And so um, they're they're advantageous um, for these for these big pharma companies. And um, Fauci has been has ignored many opportunities for various treatments for AIDS, looking for an AIDS vaccine this entire time. Um, now, there are effective treatments for HIV at this point that, uh, that are, you know, some drugs that essentially allow you to never get sick, but, uh, but Fauci is still supporting um, research for an HIV vaccine and has sunk millions and millions of taxpayer dollars into the search. Uh, for this entire time, and um, and there was actually even a uh, some testing that was done in Africa just recently that was a big bust, um, but it was all done with taxpayer money, and uh, so I'm not entirely sure why he's so focused on vaccines as the answer to everything, but you saw it with the uh, coronavirus issue too, um, that from very early on he was saying, well, what we need is a vaccine, and they've ignored uh, other treatments. Um, throughout. And and as an example of that, um, I- except for uh, remdesivir, of course, um, you may say. And then if you go hunting around, you, you'll find plenty of articles that say that um, that uh, Bill Gates and, and uh, Tony Fauci, like n- n- neither of them profited on remdesivir because there was a uh, government accountability office ruling roughly a year after Fauci promoted remdesivir that the NIH, uh, the National Institutes of Health, was not entitled to any profit from um, the uh, development and sale of remdesivir, even though, um, again, taxpayer money was used for for clinical trials and research. Um, And this is a drug that was originally developed for um, Ebola and hepatitis C. And uh, the Fauci's organization, um, the NIAID, the National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, invested millions in room severe clinical trials. Again, taxpayer money, um, millions in room severe trials. And uh, there was, because of the, the government involvement, there was the possibility that the NIH or NIAID would be able to collect some profit from room severe. Now, um, the GAO uh, government accountability office ruled against that, but it doesn't mean that um, that Fauci uh, didn't benefit from this. And so, if you start following the money around, <clears throat> before the uh, WHO recommended, and so I, actually I want to point this out really early on. Um, in November, the WHO recommended against the use of remdesivir for COVID COVID patients. It turned out to be useless at best. Um, but if you follow the money around, uh, you find that um, Fauci was appointed to the leadership council of the Global Vaccine Action Plan uh, that was created by the Gates Foundation, and that the Gates Foundation itself invests millions directly into the NIAID, Fauci's uh, department. Um, and of course, Remdesivir was uh, developed by Gilead, and uh, and Gilead's stock went up about 10% um, after the announcement of the positive trial results for coronavirus. 
um, and another 5% after FDA approval in October. Um, and, you know, that's, by the way, just a month before the WHO said that you shouldn't use it for coronavirus. Um, r- real effect of the FDA there. But um, while, uh, while the NIH couldn't collect any, um, do any profit sharing with Gilead, um, the Gates Foundation owns over a million dollars in Gilead stock and um, over three million in Gilead bonds. And then the Gates Foundation funds the NIAID, uh, where Fauci is the director. So um, the stock went up quite a bit uh, after um, Fauci promoted the drug. Um, And then one of the beneficiaries of that, the Gates Foundation, invests directly into Fauci's organization. So, And this is how a lot of this works. Like you have this little roundabout thing. So they're not directly invested um, these, you know, government employees or government agencies, they're not directly invested, but they stand to, um, to do really well from, um, changes based on various donations and where they're coming from and who else is invested and, you know, who stands to benefit. Um, so to sum up corrupt, I, I just don't see, I, I just don't see a way around it. Um, there was a, uh, you, you know, it was, he was promoting remdesivir that hadn't been through, um, peer reviewed studies, uh, at the same time that he was telling everyone to stay away from hydroxychloroquine because it hadn't been through peer reviewed studies. And then one of the big investors in his organization is also a big investor in the developer of the drug that he was promoting. Um, so uh, I've been at this for almost half an hour and I'm uncomfortable. So I just have one more little thing. This is a, this is a tiny little news story, but it just, um, I don't know. I guess it's just part of this, uh, these cultural changes that we're going through that some of which don't make any sense to me. And, uh, the story is this, um, Victoria's Secret, um, is dropping the, uh, the group of very attractive young women that they have promoting their lingerie uh, that they call the angels, I believe. And uh, they said that the, these girls um, that using these hot girls to promote their lingerie is quote, no longer culturally relevant end quote. And so they're going to um, put together a new group of women to promote their products, uh, which is going to include, uh, include Megan Rapino who you may remember is the um, the uh, mouthy? No, that's not that's not fair. At least the complaining, um, most loudly complaining member of the uh, U.S. World Cup women's team um, that's so upset about that they don't get paid the same as the men. Uh, that doesn't seem to understand economics at all, and. Um, I don't know. I just, I saw this article and I thought I don't I, I'm I'm starting to doubt that Victoria's Secret really understands what they're selling. Um they're they're selling a fantasy, right? Like so the the people that are the the men that are buying lingerie for their women um most likely see their woman as being very attractive like these girls that are promoting the lingerie now. And I don't think, um, I don't think having less attractive girls, uh, promote it is, (laughs) I don't think that it's positive. It's not the fantasy that people are looking for. I don't think, um, I, I don't think that they're going to be able to sell as well, uh, unless there really is an undercurrent, like a real change in the interest, um, to instead of, um, this, uh, um, highly sexual fantasy of the hot girl in the uh, lingerie um, that more people are interested in some kind of cuckold fantasy of an unattractive leg- lesbian like kicking you in the balls and berating you for your manhood. Um, I just don't. I just don't see it. Um, and so it's this weird kind of uh, of um, virtue signaling that they're doing. That 
I just, I can't see, and maybe, you know, Victoria's Secret, maybe it just sells itself and it won't have any impact um, on their sales. Hard to say, but I don't think that this kind of move could be positive for them. And it seems to me that they, you know, that they are running a business and, and maybe they just don't understand what it is that they're selling. So that's an odd place to end, but I don't know, it's just something to think about. It really stood out to me as, uh, as, uh, counterproductive, uh, I guess, um, with this weird kind of social agenda that, uh, that, that a company like Victoria's Secret is so far outside of to begin with that, that I don't see how making this change could be beneficial to them. Does that make sense? I hope so. Anyway, um, the plan, as usual, is to be back in a week. And uh, in the meantime, of course, we want you to f- follow us on Facebook, uh, subscribe on YouTube, uh, YouTube, iTunes, Podbean, wherever else. And, of course, like and share and uh, you know, leave comments. And you can always contact me at Michael at the Liberty Mike. And um, we'll be back in a week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Ciao.